Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the arrival of the honor party. Please remain standing for the arrival of Her Honor Janice C. Philman, Lieutenant Governor of Manitoba.
Please be seated. Please rise. There's about to be, uh, if it works, cannon fire. Cover your ears or turn down your hearing aids, please. Please be seated. All right. Now that that's out of the way. For the national anthem. Please be seated. Thank you, the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force Band, for your wonderful music. Welcome and thank you for being here today. This is my colleague, Riley uh, Curry Karpa. Uh, she is our Indigenous Commemorations Coordinator at Parks Canada. And she will be my. Beautiful land we are on or gathered on today. Jonathan? Good morning. Bonjour. 
Tansi, Bujou. On behalf of Parks Canada, welcome. I want to say personally how much I enjoyed the uh, Indigenous drum group. First thing in the morning, that's always a good thing. No, no offense to the military drummers, but the Indigenous drum group, I appreciate that very much. I want to acknowledge that we're here on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, and Dakota, as well as the birthplace of the Métis Nation and the heart of the Métis homeland. It is a great pleasure to be here with you for this wonderful occasion and to be collaborating once again with the Treaty 1 First Nations and with the Canadian Armed Forces. At Parks Canada, we're the proud to be the stewards of Canada's treasured places. While you're here, I hope you enjoy the, the natural beauty as well as the rich history of the Lower Fort Garry um, National Historic Site. This site's a part of a network of Parks Canada places in Manitoba, from the rugged tundra of Wapusk National Park to the bold landscape at Prince, Prince of Wales Fort and York Factory, to the Métis legacy at Riel House, and to the rich history of St. Andrew's Rectory, which is just down the road over here, and the historic gathering place at the Forks, the National Historic Site there. All, at all of these places, you can learn about the rich indigenous cultures that have been a part of this land from time immemorial. As many of you know, many of you here know, our military heritage has touched many families across Canada and across generations, even here as Lower Fort Garry served as a garrison between 1846 and 1874. Ces chapitres importants de l'histoire du Canada, et particulièrement le courage et les sacrifices de nos anciens combattants, doivent continuer d'être honorés et leur histoire racontée. We hope you enjoy your time here at Lower Fort Garry. We look forward to many more historic gatherings in the years to come. Stay hydrated today. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Miigwech. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I'm going to ask uh, my uh, co-MC, uh, Riley to uh, uh, introduce our honor party. So let me introduce you to our honor party. First of all, I would like to introduce you to her honor, Janice C. Philman, Lieutenant Governor of Manitoba. <laughs> Mr. Robert Falcon Wellet, Member of Parliament for Winnipeg Centre, Government of Canada Representative. Tommy Prince Jr., son of hometown hero, honoree, Tommy Prince. Karen Braun Prince, daughter of hometown hero, honoree. Chief Dennis Meaches, Long Plain First Nation. Chief Deborah Smith, Broken Head Ojibwe, First Nation. Chief Glenn Hudson, Peguis, First Nation. Chief Craig Alexander, Roseau River, Anishinaabe, First Nation. Chief Derek Henderson, Seg King, First Nation. Chief Lance Roulette, who I believe couldn't be here with us today, unfortunately. Chief, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chief Francine Meaches, Swan Lake First Nation. His Worship Brian Bowman, Mayor of Winnipeg. His Worship Larry Johan. Hansen, Mayor Selkirk. Her Worship, Joy Sull, Mayor of Regional Municipality of St. Andrews. Her Worship, Debbie Feeblecorn, Mayor of Regional Municipality of St. Clements. 
Rear Admiral, Admiral Simon Page, Royal Canadian Navy. Major General Alain Peltier, Royal Canadian Air Force. Brigadier General Stephen Lecroix, Commander 3rd Division, Canadian Army. Major Jeff Brown, Acting Commander, 2nd Battalion, Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. Mr. Devin Beaudry, Manitoba Director, Aboriginal Veterans, Atatun. Miss Loretta Ross, Treaty Commissioner. Mr. Rick Bennett, Royal Canadian Legion, Manitoba Command. And Mr. Jonathan Arnold, Executive Director, Prairies and Northwest, Ter Northwest Territories, Parks Canada. Thank you, Walalan for all being here today with us to represent your rep respective organizations and communities. Next, I would like to once again invite the North Eagle Drum Group to sing the veteran song.
As we say in my, in my language, on the east coast of Turtle Island, Walalin, again, to the North Eagle Drum Group for sharing your music and your culture with us today. Right now, I would like to invite Chief Dennis Meaches to be, speak on behalf of Treaty Number 1. Ah, bonjour. Friends, relatives, uh, it's a beautiful day to be with you here, here at uh, Lower Fort Garry, a very uh, uh, sacred site for the Anishinaabe people and all people. Um, it's been a hundred and well, 48 years, 148 years since the signing of the, the treaty. We're on the verge of, uh, of uh, honoring an important milestone, the 150th anniversary that's coming up on uh, August 3rd, a few years from now. Um, we've, I was here 50 years ago. There was a big celebration here in 1971. I was nine years old. I was at a powwow here. And uh, that's when I first met Sergeant Tommy Prince. And I remember that day as if it was yesterday, how important it was for me and many of our, our people to, to honor Sergeant Tommy Prince 50 years ago here on this site. So I, I acknowledge all the veterans, all our soldiers. I, uh, I thank you for all being here today. I think it's a very important ceremony to, to uh, honor the veterans, the Eagle Staffs, um, my uncle, Norman Peters, my good friend, Dallas Cinnamon, and all these uh, fine gentlemen that are here. Um, the Treaty One Nation is close uh, to having a, also a major event. It's kind of bittersweet. For, for many years, uh, you're aware of the Cap Young story, I'm sure many of you are. Uh, I think we're not that far off from achieving a, a Treaty One Nation and a, a reserve. Um, and the history of the Cap Young and how important that is. So uh, we're we're working towards that goal on behalf of our chiefs and our, our citizens of Long, of Long Plains, Sandy Bay, Swan Lake, Brokenhead, Sagging, and um, we, we, we've been working so hard for this for, for many years. And in some ways, because uh, Cap Young represented such an important site for the military, the Department of National Defense, many of our uncles, our, our parents, our grandparents came through the Cap Young. So it's our goal, it's our goal someday to have an Indigenous War Museum. I don't really believe that many First Nations uh, across this country and, and people in general really understand the full significance of the Indigenous War effort and the contributions to protecting Canada. My uncle George Myron, um, he uh, spoke about it and he was, um, and he's a former chief also, he mentioned that, that uh, our warriors, our, our soldiers, did not have to join the war effort. They're exempt from, from war, war service. But they enlisted in the, probably the greatest numbers of any, of any ethnic group in, in this country. And the reason why is they fought to defend the treaty, the treaty relationship that we have, the 1871 treaty that was signed. They fought to defend that. And they enlisted voluntarily. And, uh, and that's why it's so important, uh, because uh, they said if Canada falls, then our, our treaty will fall. It's important that we protect, and, and being allies of the Crown, it's important to protect our way of life, and hand in hand with Canada. So I, I do again appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today on behalf of the Chiefs, and acknowledge the, uh, the, the uh, dignitaries that are here, and I, I really appreciate uh, this beautiful day. Many of us are celebrating treaty events uh, this past little while, Long Plain is uh, having uh, hosting their annual powwow. Seguin has a powwow this week and also two Treaty Day powwow. So there's many events uh, commemorating this uh, important time. So I want to thank you very much. We, ho we hope to see you here year after year. And the 150th is just around the corner. So we're working with our partner, Canada, our ally, and uh, making uh, uh, that a historic celebration also too. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you. Miigwech. Kanaakunim kana. English Chief Meaches. And thank you for those inspiring words, uh, Chief uh, Meaches. Thank you. I now invite.
Her Honor Janice C. Fieldman, Lieutenant Governor of Manitoba, to speak on behalf of the Crown and Manitobans. Well, it is a beautiful day, and I do start by saying to Chief Dennis Meaches, thank you. Thank you for sharing some of your heart feelings about that day 50 years ago. You take us back there and you make it be very real. Thank you. To uh, Robert Falcon, we'll let a welcome. And uh, I think everybody has been properly welcomed, except I do want to acknowledge the Tommy Prince family, who I had the honor of meeting ahead of our gathering here. And it is pure honor. Thank you all for being who you are and being here. To our military people, in this job, I have come to know more about what you do and who you are, and I have nothing but the utmost admiration, and I thank you for your service. To all the chiefs and to all those in civic leadership, military personnel who are here, the other mayor, uh, mayors, thank you for your leadership. And to the elders and knowledge keepers, I would say to the children who are here, you are our future. It's an amazing country and we all know it. We just have to do everything we can to make sure you are having the absolute best experience so that you can step up and take that baton. And so to all of you, friends, Manitobans, it's an honor to join you today in celebrating Manitoba's hometown hero, Sergeant Tommy Prince. I begin by acknowledging that we are gathered at the site of the signing of Treaty 1 and recognizing, of course, that the Anishinaabe lived here long before this was the site of a fur trade fort or, and continue, they continue to live along the Red River and throughout Manitoba. We have come to the right place to pay homage to a great Manitoban and especially to Sergeant Tommy Prince. Lower Fort Garry National Historic Site is a special, sacred place for Manitobans. Here is the history of the fur trade because it comes to life. Here too, we can almost detect the echoes of the footsteps of the first men of the Northwest Mounted Police preparing for their famous March West. Most importantly, this was where the first of the numbered treaties was signed. Here, the process of establishing a sharing relationship between Canada and the Indigenous peoples of the West began. As we know, Canada failed in many ways for many years to honour the words and the spirit of the treaties. That did not stop Indigenous people from coming forward when Canada needed them and volunteering to protect this country. Thousands of Indigenous men and women volunteered in the First and Second World Wars and the Korean War. Volunteers from every First Nation and every Métis community served alongside fellow Manitobans. They served in the trenches of the First World War. They served in the Second World War's Battle of the Atlantic. In the air over Europe, in Italy, France, Belgium, the Netherlands and Germany. And the desperate defense of Hong Kong. They served in Korea and in every peacekeeping and security operation since. In the Second World War in Korea, one Manitoban who continually distinguished himself with his courage and skill had a direct connection to our meeting place today as the grandson of Chief Henry Prince, one of the signatories of Treaty 1. So today, as we recognize Sergeant Tommy Prince as a hometown hero, we recommit ourselves to sharing this land and to the values and principles that he and his comrades in arms defeated. I have to believe after today's service your memory boxes will be filled and you will have more questions and you will be grateful for this amazing service of these people and of our amazing land. I thank you. Merci. Miigwech. Your Honour, thank you very much for those enlightening words and for speaking from the heart. and for acknowledging the significant contributions of Manitobans uh, and our veterans during the World Wars and for speaking about the history of the four walls within which we, are, we find ourselves today. 
And I also want to thank, I know it's hot, we're going to move along here, but I would ask uh, Riley now to, uh, to invite our next speaker. I will now invite uh, Mr. Robert Falcon Willett, Member of Parliament for Win Winnipeg Centre, to speak on behalf of the Government of Canada and on behalf of the Honourable Catherine McKenna, Minister Re Responsible for Environment and Climate Change, as well as for Parks Canada. It's a great pleasure to be here. Homeland of the Anishinaabe Nation, Dakota, Oji Crees, Dene peoples. This is also Manitoba, is the home of the Inuit, who also reside here in our province. And we also, it is the homeland of the Metis Nation, and we all live here together. Your Honor, to the family members of Tommy Prince, who I remember meeting you so uh, when I came to Winnipeg, you greeted me so uh, welcomely at a number of events. To the chiefs and elders of Treaty 7 uh, or Treaty 1 territory, the First Nations, Major John Pelletier, Rear Admiral Paget, Brigadier General Lacroix, and veterans and serving members of the Armed Forces, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Madame et Messieurs, and also a you know, special welcome to our, you know, Eagle Staff holders and the young uh, people who are doing that today and our old veterans were also working hard with those Eagle Staffs in the hot sun there. It's a great pleasure for me to bring greetings on behalf of the Government of Canada and to be here representing Catherine McKenna, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change and also the Minister who is responsible for Parks Canada. I have served in the military and the armed forces uh, within Army units, the Van Duzium Regiment in Valcartier, as well as the 5th Field Ambulance, the Medic Corps. But I was also in the Navy for a number of years, and so I'm very proud to see the, the Navy personnel, the white uniform here, and also the gentlemen and the ladies in the, wearing the black uniforms back there in the hot sun, you know, baking out, cooking. And I've done that a number of times, cooked in the sun, but, uh, you know, I, I feel for you, and I hope you'll get some water at the end. Now, some of you may be asking, what is the connection between Parks Canada and the commemoration of Canada's military history? The Government of Canada is committed to connecting Canadians to significant places, peoples and events that shaped the history of our nation. As one of Parks Canada's roles is to be a storyteller of Canada's rich and diverse heritage, both natural and cultural. Nearly 50 of the National Historic Sites and National Parks administered by Parks Canada across the country have a direct connection to the World Wars. Now, since 2015, Parks Canada has also been telling the unique and amazing stories of the country's military history through the Hometown Heroes Initiative. Through this national program since 2015, Parks Canada works directly with communities to honour the men and women from all walks of life, both military and civilian, who contributed to Canada's efforts during the two world wars. To date, more, to date, more than 135 heroes have been recognized at various Parks Canada locations across our nation, including two dozen Indigenous veterans. And today we will be unveiling the latest Hometown Heroes panel dedicated to the late Sergeant Tommy Prince. And before this is done, Brigadier General Lacroix will tell you the story of this, his extraordinary military career. The Tommy Prince story provides a voice for the thousands of First Nations, Métis and Inuit community members and indeed Canadians as a whole who sacrificed so much to defend our freedoms and values that we hold so dear as Canadians. The experiences of the Canadian and Indigenous veterans, like my grandfather who returned from to Canada after the World Wars was often very different from those of other uniformed personnel. The House of Commons Standing Committee on Veterans Affairs recently heard considerable testimony on how Indigenous veterans were treated when they came back from the war. They faced discrimination, illness, poverty, and not an access to the programs that other Canadians had. It was discriminatory. The committee published a report this past February entitled Indigenous Veterans from Memories of Injustice to Lasting Recognition, and the Government of Canada is pre currently preparing a response to this report. Now, an important statement made in this report if the wounds associated with these injustices are to be healed, both sides must take the crucial first step of acknowledging the objective truth of past prejudice against Indigenous veterans and the broken promises that even today undermine Indigenous veterans' trust in the Government of Canada. 
And I invite everyone today from all walks of life to walk on that path of healing, on that path of reconciliation. Sergeant Tommy Prince courageously fought not only on foreign battlefields, but also here at home for the recognition of indigenous veterans, significant contribution to our nation, but he also fought for indigenous peoples. Following the Second World War, he served as the vice president and spokesperson in the Manitoba Indian Association, and in 1947 joined other First Nations leaders in testifying before a special joint committee of the Senate and the House of Commons to advocate for the abolition of the Indian Act and to fight for the respect of our existing treaties. It is my distinct pleasure to announce that this week, Catherine McKenna, the Minister responsible for Parks Canada and the Minister responsible for the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada, announced that on recommendation of that board, she has designated Tommy Prince as a person of national historic significance. This is, this is the highest form of historical commemoration available to the government. It is an enduring recognition that Mr. Prince had a significant impact on the history of our nation. And for those who are gathered here today, he is truly a hometown hero, but he's also much more than that. Tommy Prince is someone whose contributions are significant to the history of each and every one of us. Even if we don't want to recognize it, he is significant. A bronze plaque recognizing this designation will be produced by the board and unveiled at a future ceremony. The Government of Canada invites all Canadians to be inspired by these stories of people, places, and events that shape Canada's history. Well, Lalin, Mr. Ouellette, uh, thank you so much for um, acknowledging the significant contribution of Indigenous veterans from the East, so South, North and West today. I also thank you for sharing the truth about how Indigenous veterans were treated, as well as for inviting us to walk on this long path of healing. We will now show a three minute video presentation which encompasses excerpts from the 1997 award-winning national film board documentary entitled Forgotten Warriors. There's video screens to the left and right of you uh, there to, uh, to watch. At the age of 18, my dad said to me before I went over, okay. this is none of our Native Indians business going over there fighting with the Germans. He said to me, if the white people want to fight amongst themselves, let them. You know, you have no business over there. I said, Dad, it's too late. I've signed my name on a dollar line. I'm gone. The world was at war. A war that reached into our homes and families. Our young men and women enlisted into thousands. Some asked, if it was our battle to fight. Most of the men and women served in the Army. The Air Force and Navy restricted enlistment until 1943. Some women joined the Canadian Women's Army Auxiliary. Mary Gray Ice was the first Indian woman to enlist. Prior to that, I never left the confines of the reserve. I just stayed on the reserve, didn't know what the other half lived like. But when I did get into the army, then I found out what other people were like. I had black buddies, I had Jewish buddies, Scottish boys, English. We treated each other all the same, it didn't matter. You move so much and you move on command, no, nothing impresses you. Uh, even coming home, didn't get too shook up about that until we got to Halifax, and then it was something else. Many of our young men and women received honors. Men like Corporal Martin from Six Nations and Private George Monroe, who both received the Military Medal for Bravery. We owe a great debt to these veterans, and uh, I'm very sad uh, about the way they were treated when I, when I talked to them, about how some of them have uh, have lost their status as Indians because they participated in the war. How some of the reserve lands were 
were cut off and given to white veterans. Uh, I'm not quite sure of uh, what I'm entitled. No one said a, a word. And of course, uh, the other uh, veterans that are uh, that are not native, they were told what they the, what they were entitled to, but not us. I used to break out in sweats. I'd be yelling. My dad finally put me in the caboose to sleep because I wake up my brothers and sisters and that. So I used to sleep out there. And the only way I could forget that was get myself stoned and eh, really drunk. And then I'd sleep till whenever it was sun up. But I used to. Kina nasku mu ono kiato kiota tuwa gihitse hui ignorant tunes. Tremaa ge ga ve hats tu sky minok. Eku tu hui tsi hui tsu. This video will also be shown in its entirety throughout the summer in um, both official languages in the theater, in the visitor center that you walk by coming over here. So what you saw is just a three minute excerpt of the 52 minute award winning documentary, as my uh, colleague Riley explained. And hmm? okay. Okay. Um, I would now like to ask Ms. Loretta Ross, Treaty Commissioner, to come up and read the honor roll of veteran members of the seven Treaty One First Nations who served in the World Wars. The list is by no means exhaustive, but a starting point with communities from the seven Treaty One First Nations contributing to the compilation. So more names will be added as they become available. And as Chief Michi said, earlier, um, the objective is to have uh, a, a more exhaustive honor roll produced for the uh, Indigenous Veterans Museum, which will uh, uh, hopefully eventually be built uh, on the uh, former Capion Barracks. So um, this, here we are. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you and, and miigwech. And thank you for the opportunity to be here and spend a, a little bit of time with you this morning. I also want to thank Chief Meaches and uh, the Lieutenant Governor for providing you with a little bit of the history um, about the significance of veterans and the treaty area. It saves me from, from doing that. And, and uh, so I'm glad that uh, people are getting to know and understand the history and the significance. Um, so before I read this, I will add my little uh, two cents in, into that and just remind everyone that at the, the Treaty Commissioner of the day did uh, confirm to the First Nations as they entered into treaty with the Crown uh, at that time that they did not have to enter uh, into war on behalf of, of Canada at the time. And so there was no obligation for the First Nations to enter into, into war and to go into war. And so they did that as Chief Meaches had said, because the treaty was that significant and important to them. And in fact, in the entering World War I, one in three First Nation men entered into, uh, chose to go to battle uh, for Canada. And from then on, other First Nation um, men and women were able to and chose voluntarily to enter into war, including um, Sergeant Tommy Prince and others. So with that, I will read the, the honor roll from the Broken Head Ojibwe Nation, William Robert Bear. And I, th I think we could probably hold the applause till the end. Yes, thank you. A.R. Bunn, Elmer G. Bunn, T.A. Chief, Gilbert Desjarlais, Herbert Desjarlais, William G. Folster, Alex Grisdale, John Thomas Grisdale, Rudolph Olson, W. G. Packle, Thomas George 
Tommy Prince, Morris Prince, H. F. Sinclair, John Robert Spence, from Saguin First Nation, A. Fontaine, and there's another A. Fontaine, I'm not sure if that's a, uh, another A. Fontaine, but we will acknowledge that as well. Felix, Felix Ambrose Fontaine, L. Fontaine, A. Guimond, J. P. Guimond, William George Mann, from the Long Plain First Nation, George Daniels, James Jim Daniels, Arthur Meaches, George Myram or Myron, M. Paget, R. Prince, T. Sia, Tom Chasky, from Swan Lake First Nation, C. K. Cameron, S. Cameron, John K. Daniels, and Clarence Kiwaitan. From the Peguis First Nation, Joseph Thomas Anderson, Kenneth McClure Asham, Albert Alexander Chief, R. J. Cochran, A. E. Cook, H. Cook, T. E. Manigway, Oswald McCorister, William Robert McCorister, C. McPherson, E. Mitchell, O. Olson, Henry Paco, Percy Parisian, Sydney Parisian, George C. Sinclair, K. M. Sinclair, M. C. Sinclair, M. Smith, A. G. Stevenson, A. J. Stevenson, W. Stevenson, A. L. Stranger, Carl Thomas, David Thomas, James Oliver Thomas, John Thomas, L. G. Thomas. And from the Roseau River Anishinaabe Nation, Joseph Henry, S. Sini, A. Henry, and last but not least, from the Sandy Bay Ojibwe Nation, D. Roulette, and Baptiste Demery, Baptiste. So with that, miigwech, and we honor all of those and others that we may, that will continue to be added. Miigwech. Thank you, uh, Treaty Commissioner uh, Ross, uh, for reading out the names of those who sacrificed so much. N'oublions jamais, lest we forget. Next, I would like to invite Chief Deborah Smith to speak on behalf of the Broken Head Ojibwe First Nation, the community that Tommy Prince was from. It is my honor to be standing here this morning to speak on behalf of the leadership and the elders and our members of the Broken Head Ojibwe Nation on Treaty 1 territory. It's also my honor to be standing here where 148 years ago a broken head came to negotiate and sign treaty with the Queen's representatives. Before I begin my opening remarks, I would like to acknowledge and want to say thank you to the elder Peter Atkinson for conducting the pipe ceremony. I also want to acknowledge the presence of Sergeant Tommy Prince's family, his son, his daughters, his grandchildren, 
and his great-grandchildren who are gathered with us today. Acknowledge Lieutenant Governor of Manitoba Janice Gilman for her words. To the many representatives of the governments of Manitoba, Canada, and the various municipalities. I also want to acknowledge my fellow chiefs from Treaty 1 and any councillors who are here gathered with us today. It is truly an honour to be here to speak today, to bring greetings and to honour the life of Sergeant Tommy Prince. One of Canada's most decorated Aboriginal war heroes and a promoter of Aboriginal rights. Thomas George Prince was born on October 25, 1915 in Petersfield, Manitoba. He was the great-great-grandson of Chief Peguis and with his demonstrated bravery as a soldier and his skills as a leader, Thomas lived up to the high standards set by his great-great-grandfather when World War II started in 1939, Thomas was 24 years old. He volunteered for service, and in 1942, he received special training as a paratrooper. Only nine people out of 100 finished this difficult course. Thomas was one of those nine. He, th he then became a member <coughs> excuse me, of the first special service force, a group of the toughest men from both Canada and the United States. It was so feared by the men, by the German soldiers, it became known to them as the Devil's Brigade. On February 8, 1944, Sergeant Tommy Prince went out alone on a voluntary assignment to run a radio wire 1,500 meters into enemy territory to an abandoned farmhouse where he established an observation post. Thomas Prince earned the Military Medal for Bravery for this act of bravery. And during this, his lifetime, he was awarded 10 medals, including the U.S. Silver Star for gallantry in action against the enemy. He was also awarded two additional medals that were created after his passing. The wartime experience of Sergeant Tommy Prince is the stuff that legends are made of. It is as if he was born and bred to be one great task, to do this one great task. He was a true son of his people and a great warrior. Back on the Broken Head Ojibwe Nation, when Tommy came back from war, life proved difficult. So Tommy moved to Winnipeg and there he started a successful cleaning business. In 1946, the Manitoba Indian Association chose Thomas to be their chairperson. Thomas consulted with the Aboriginal people of Manitoba, then presented their concerns to the Canadian government in a clear and really well-defined report. Unfortunately, the government implemented only a few of these requests, but his own people had always given and recognized his efforts. In Brokenhead, we have a school named after Sergeant Tommy Prince. All of our students are proud of the accomplishments of Sergeant Tommy Prince. And we are proud to have a hometown hero of his caliber in our history. His accomplishments and his bravery are examples for our young warriors to follow. We recognize the sacrifices that all of the young men who went off to war and contributed to the war effort for the rights and freedoms that we enjoy and share today. Gachi miigwech. Miigwech, Chief Smith, for your moving words about Tommy Prince, a national war hero. For this next portion of the ceremony today, we will soon be unveiling the hometown hero story panel that you got a little preview of just a minute ago. I also wanted to say a quick miigwech to my colleague and friend Alan Sutherland for having blessed the plaque, uh, the panel um, previous to the ceremony. I also wanted to let you know the significance of the red cloth on the panel. Usually we use a black cloth, but today we wanted to make sure we used red to represent the color of the original people 
the colors of the, the color red in the medicine wheel, as well as the color of protection. I now invite Brigadier General Stephen LaCroix, Commander, 3rd Division of the Canadian Army, to introduce the hometown hero honoree, the late Sergeant Tommy Prince. Uh, merci, Ray. Uh, I might I also add, red is the color of the Devil's Brigade patch, actually. Uh, so, uh, Your Honor, um, Member of Parliament Ouellet, family members of uh, Tommy Prince, uh, actually the entire family that's, been, that's here, that's already been acknowledged a, a number of times, uh, but a special uh, shout out as well to the family members who could not make the trip for various reasons that I discussed with uh, Tommy earlier on. Uh, Chief and Elders of 7 Treaty No. 1 First Nations, General Petit, Amiral Page, uh, colleagues of the Canadian Armed Forces, uh, distinguished guests, uh, elected officials, uh, Mesdames et Messieurs, uh, special welcome as well to the cadets that I see around. Uh, that's our bench uh, for the, the, the military, so we're very happy to see them. And, and also, if you uh, would join me in, in, uh, uh, in a round of applause there for uh, our troops and band who are baking in the sun there. We, we usually get the opportunity to do this at the end of a ceremony, but uh, the protocol is a bit uh, different today for the ceremony. So. Uh, Thank you for the troops uh, and the band. So today, nearly uh, eight decades after he voluntarily pledged to serve Canada in uniform, I'm deeply honoured uh, to, uh, on behalf of our Chief of Defence Staff, uh, General Jonathan Vance, to be the person introducing Sergeant Tommy Prince as a hometown hero. So uh, as we heard before, he didn't have to, he volunteered, uh, and in 1940 uh, decided to join and uh, sign up with uh, the Royal Canadian Engineers to uh, head off to uh, World War II. Uh, we heard that he didn't have to, that's already been mentioned. He probably didn't know what he was getting into at that, at that point in life and actually he, he kind of alluded to that uh, in the video. Uh, so he volunteers for this, heads over and uh, joins the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion in 1942. Soon after, uh, they recognized the talent that they had on their hands. So he, uh, he's assigned to that elite force that we discussed, the Devil's Brigade, uh, the first joint Canadian-US organization uh, that uh, was discussed just a few minutes ago. So as a paratrooper, uh, we also heard about that story, right, of uh, Tommy dressed in uh, disguise, I guess, as a, as a local farmer, walking up and down the line pretending to be uh, an Italian, I presume. I don't know if he, I don't think he looked like an Italian, but from a distance, I guess, <laughs> I guess it worked. Yeah, and, um, and, and then the intelligence that he was able, able to gather by doing this, uh, almost crazy, right? You think about it, walking around the line uh, in front of Germans, collecting all that data that proved invaluable there for the Allies uh, to, to do their job. Uh, absolutely uh, astonishing, actually. I would have loved to, to have a beer and have that conversation with him as to how we came to, uh, to do this. Uh, the other story that we didn't hear, maybe, uh, that is also uh, in some of the pamphlets I read, is uh, in southern France, once again, you know, contributing to uh, uh, essentially uh, capturing 1,000 German prisoners of war through his courageous acts that are all well documented. And this leads us to, uh, yeah, please. Uh, and, and that leads us to, uh, to him for the first actions in Italy, the second actions in France, uh, being awarded uh, the Military Medal for Courage. We've already talked about that one. Uh, and and uh, another medal, and both presented uh, before King George VI at Buckingham Palace, which was no no small feat either. So it's, uh, it's a great honor to, to, to even be standing here discussing this. Uh, so, you know, there's, uh, the military has its reputation, but I guess life wasn't that bad in the military, or probably sadly enough, life in the military was better than what Tommy faced back in the streets of Canada. So he signs up again, uh, and off he goes to Korea this time and serves with uh, the Princess Patricia's Light Infantry, the PPCLI, or the Patricia's, who are represented in great numbers here today, actually uh, in the front right there, 
part of the, a third of the delegation on parade is actually from the Patricias. Uh, so in 51, uh, this is another feat there that might be a bit well uh, less documented. He participates in the horrible battle of Kapyong, not Kapyong in Winnipeg, Kapyong in Korea. One of Canada's uh, greatest, ugliest, least known military achievement. So in this battle, you have 700 Canadian troops facing 5,000 Chinese who desperately want that hill uh, of strategic significance uh, for the battle. So they hold off for two days, uh, survive, or a lot of them survive, a lot of them don't, hold the ground until they're relieved two days later. So uh, for this, uh, once again, Tommy uh, he seems to be uh, uh, landing close to, uh, to honors, well-deserved honors uh, that uh, surround his feats, part of the battalion, and they're recognized by the U.S president and receive a unit citation for this. The only Canadian unit ever to receive that citation. So uh, as we know, uh, unfortunately, Tommy's reintegration to civilian life back here uh, in Winnipeg, and the story is the same pretty much across Canada, uh, it, it, uh, it wasn't that easy. So his military experience came with a heavy toll, uh, a toll that uh, today's veterans uh, often face. Um, and then following that uh, honorable discharge, he finds himself uh, back here in Manitoba, uh, living through uh, also what we've heard, discrimination, poverty, and uh, inequity, I guess. You know, the, the, the balance of uh, what was afforded to his peers in combat uh, was, was different than what he was afforded uh, or what was made available to him. And, uh, and for that, uh, I'm truly sorry. Um, a man that joined the military to fight what was, for what was just, what was right, what was fair, was now finding himself in a uh, difficult situation here on the streets of Winnipeg. So from a Canadian Army and, of course, uh, the broader Canadian Armed Forces perspective, uh, Indigenous people uh, are, are what we look for. Uh, your skill set, your heritage, uh, your warrior spirit, your fighting spirit, fighting for what's right. Uh, is what represent the best in a Canadian soldier, in a Canadian airman, uh, air person, uh, in a sailor. And uh, we want some of that. We want more of that. Uh, we want anybody in the Canadian uh, population that represents uh, its diversity, its makeup, to be able to fight at home and abroad and represent those interests to the rest of the world and to the Canadian population. So the Canadian defense team remains entirely uh, dedicated to fostering this inclusive uh, work environment for Indigenous members, uh, in particular in this, in this case, with dignity, respect, fairness, and of course, embrace all those values that we so cherish. So I encourage everybody here uh, and everybody listening actually uh, at home and abroad uh, to learn about and be inspired by the story of a great Kenyan hero, Sergeant Tommy Prince, and all other Indigenous veterans for that matter, who did so much for our country. I would now invite Tommy Prince, his sister Karen, um, MP Wallet, uh, colleagues uh, General Pelletier and Amiral Page, uh, to join me up here to unveil the hometown hero story panel dedicated to Sergeant Tommy Prince. Thank you. Thank you. And because it's me, I, I, I like to break out a protocol there. Uh, I just want to take a second to thank Ray and Park Canada for putting this together. Uh, thanks to your team uh, and, and thanks for everything you've done together to gather all these people here uh, on, on Treaty One territory to honor one of our uh, finest heroes. Thank you very much. Merci, uh, General uh, uh, Lacroix. You may return to your seats, thank you. Um, 
for uh, sharing those uh, stories of uh, his uh, of Sergeant Tommy Prince's incredible military achievements and to this day he still serves as a source of inspiration um, so we uh, as we um, move towards the end of the ceremony I know it's very very uh, warm over here um, but I want to uh, reiterate um, uh, that uh, the importance of, of telling these stories especially to the young people and to help uh, with that and uh, to also share his own story when he was a younger man um, spending time with his father, I now would like to invite uh, my good friend uh, Tommy Prince Jr. to say a few words on behalf of the Prince family. Well, good morning ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's quite the honor to be here. Um, I know the, uh, my siblings would love to say something, but I don't think there's much time, so I'm going to be the uh, spokesman for the family. Uh, Your Honour, Janice Philman, Mayor Bowman, ladies and gentlemen, dignitaries of all, elders, chiefs, the Prince family says thank you for showing up here today. The Prince family would also like to give a special thank you to uh, Parks Canada and everyone for making this possible. Thank you, Parks Canada. I don't think I have to uh, touch too much on um, our deceased father's military history that's been well said today, but I will say that um, our veterans. have been um, poorly treated, mistreated by governments and are still being mistreated by the government. Facts are, if they got a pension, it was minimized, it was cut. Secondly, they don't get the medical treatment they need, whether it's mentally or physically. And last but not least, you heard that we have many homeless veterans. I work with a, a group called Home for Heroes. And this group came to Winnipeg the summer of 18. The president of that group approached Baron Bowman, Mayor Brian Bowman of Winnipeg. He approached him asking him for a piece of land so that they may build homes for heroes. They have the money to build the homes, they have the money to maintain them. And a piece, piece of land, just a piece of land anywhere that they could build these homes for our veterans. The answer he received was, no, don't have any land for you. It strikes me funny, there's lots of land in Winnipeg for other things that are happening. Things that are, you know, s seems not ne necessarily need to be done. And um, here we have a bunch of men and women that went to fight, for this, to fight for this country so that we may live in peace and harmony. And we can't repay them with a, with a home. There's something definitely wrong with this government. They have to step up to the plate and say, hey, We've mistreated you. They have to. I'm sorry to say that, but that's the way I see it. I watched my father die homeless in Winnipeg. I offered him to come and live with me and my girlfriend. But being the type of man that he was, he said, I don't want to be a burden. bothers me deeply that I have to stand here and say this. But we got to do something for our heroes. 
not only of the Second World War, First World War, but for the wars that they are fighting today. We have to do something, and then we can truly say we look after our own. You've um, heard how my father um, attended Buckingham Palace with his uh, brother Morse. Um, from giving and receiving here, um, when our father received the uh, Silver Star and the uh, Military Medal, uh, which were pinned on his chest by King George VI, King George VI, his right-hand man, asked him, Well, Mr. Prince, what do you have to say and think about that? Our father, being lost for words and didn't know what to say, replied, Balls, said the Queen. <laughs> uh, this I was told by my Uncle Morris that my father did say that. So, with no disrespect to anyone or anything, please enjoy yourselves and have a great afternoon. Miigwech. Thank you. Miigwech, Tommy, for sharing that with us. <laughs> Uh, I, I know the feeling about it being lost for words, so trust me. Um, but thank you uh, to the entire Prince family uh, for your generosity, for being here with us. And uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, some of you ahead of the ceremony. And uh, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to have you all here with us on this special day. But as we, approach, uh, as we approach the end of the ceremony, uh, let me outline what is about to take place. Because we have to get uh, these uh, men, brave men and women out of the sun. Uh, they've been there for a long time. Um, so here's how we're going to do this. So um, uh, we're about to get ready for a fly pass, a compliment of our um, great uh, friends from the Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, and uh, it'll be followed by the Lieutenant Governor's departure and firing of the cannon to end the ceremony. So, to observe the fly pass, um, what I would do is, for those of you that are in the front row, I want you to step forward, but everybody else, the best place for to see the aircraft and take pictures is right there around uh, that banner to your to your um, left so i'm going to invite you to go stand there now stretch your legs for those of you who want to take pictures come up front over here please okay there are some people who can usher you there and for those of you in the front row you can come and stand over here it'll be coming over right this way okay Again, the, uh, the aircraft will be flying from, uh, from east to west. It will be performing a 270 degree turn and come back towards us and fly right over the, uh, the tent. So, ladies and gentlemen, what you're seeing approaching over here is a C-130, otherwise known as a Hercules, and the reason why 
uh, it was important for us to have that specific aircraft flown today is because it is multi-purpose it does search and rescue it uh, does airlift but uh, the connection to today's ceremony is the fact that the, since Tommy Prince was a renowned paratrooper, today's serving members who are also paratroopers typically drop out of the tail end of that aircraft. And uh, when I was a, an air cadet, um, I also had the privilege of flying aboard those great aircrafts. So it is going to circle around. It, it, you saw it fly at approximately 1,500 feet. It is uh, decreasing its altitude. It's doing a 270 degree turn. Uh, as it's doing so, it is dropping to a thousand feet. And as it will approach this uh, location, um, we got clearance uh, thanks to uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force and uh, NAVCAN. It will drop down to a very low 500 feet. So you will be able to count the rivets on the underbelly of this aircraft. <laughs> it's coming in. applause for the Royal Canadian Air Force. Now please remain standing. Those of you in the honor party can just get back to your seats uh, as we do the final sequence. Those of you who are already on the grass you can stay there but we ask that you remain still for a few more moments so that we can uh, as, uh, have her honor uh, leave the premises but also more importantly so we can get our brave uh, women and men off the parade so that they too can have uh, the opportunity to cool off uh, so we will be um, um, uh, the Royal Canadian uh, Air Force Band will be performing God Save the Queen in a moment remain standing for the departure of Her Honor, the Lieutenant Governor. Please remain standing for the final firing of the uh, historic uh, artillery piece.
On behalf of Parks Canada, Riley and I wish to sincerely thank everyone for being here today, and especially the Canadian Armed Forces members. It isn't easy to set out on parade on, for such an extended amount of time. I've, I've done it myself. It's not fun. But thank you all for your service and for keeping our families safe. Folks, please remain standing as the parade leaves. I also wanted to say, following this ceremony, you're all invited to join us for refreshments just to your right on the other side of the wide fence. I heard there will be bannock and jam. And a reminder that the Summer Bear Dance Troupe will be performing at the encampment area from 12 to 4. There will be a treaty tour as well with my colleague Alan at 1.30 right in front of the big house here. Walalan, miigwech, merci, thank you, msit nogama, all my relations.